I remember getting a call from the uh, fire department commander telling me that they were not sure they were going to be able to contain the fire. And I said, you know, we've had such terrible loss of life. Maybe the smartest thing to do is, is pull it. Uh, and they made that decision to pull. We don't need to ask permission from the owner, no. When we're in charge of the building, we're in charge, and that decision would be uh, the fire chief and his alone. That's why I would know that there is no conspiracy. I ask every viewer to come to their own conclusion about the language Larry's using and the emphasis. Maybe the smartest thing to do is, is pull it. My personal response to his comment is that he was uh, involved in a decision to, to uh, bring the building down. But uh, who knows uh, what he was thinking or saying. This is just speculation. We'll set up surveying instruments to monitor and see if there's any movement in the building. Uh, we're, we're concerned of the possibility of collapse of the building. And we had a discussion with one particular engineer there, and we asked him if we uh, allowed it to burn, uh, could we anticipate a collapse, and if so, how soon? And it turned out that he was pretty much right on the money, that he said uh, in his current state, about you have about five hours. They could have been a target. I felt at the time because of where we were was could have been a uh, serious target. And plus the other federal agencies in that building. So the decision is made to evacuate the very office designed to respond to a terrorist attack. The Office of Emergency Management. At a gleaming state-of-the-art emergency operations center on the 23rd floor of the World Trade Center's Building 7. Built to withstand bomb blasts and hurricane force winds, but not a 110-story building collapse. some of the only pictures of Building 7 at that moment. Just over a minute later, the fire alarm in Tower 7 is triggered. The 
because it's on test, there's no information about where the fires are. What happened? Did the, did the side of the building come down? Uh, come down. What, what do you see? Uh, it was pretty clear at one point, and then uh, there's a whole bunch of smoke and glass. And I think we just got the last ones in this building right now. I think you should leave. Everybody else is gone. The official investigators say ordinary fires were responsible for the collapse of Tower 7. But if that's right, why didn't the fire services fight them? There's no way to put the fire out. Well, we got all kinds of water problems. The uh, two trade buildings took out the main. You know, we can handle just about everything. This is beyond. Miller realizes that 7 World Trade Center is next to fall. See what the white smoke is? You see this thing leaning like this? And it's definitely going to There's no way to stop it. Because you have to go up in there to put it out, and it's already, if the, if the structural integrity is not there on the building. Looking at the upper floors of Tower 7, you can see columns gone, floors collapsed, heavy smoke coming out, and fire. The upper floors were an inferno. And then he had to go into that building to assess it. You could hear the building creak above us. You could hear things fall. You could hear the fire burning. You could see columns just hanging from the upper floors, gaping holes in the floors up above us. There was an elevated car that was blown out of the shaft and it was down the hall. The, you know, the, the massive impact from the fall of Tower 1 onto Tower 7. When they collapsed, the Twin Towers severed water mains, stopping the sprinklers in Tower 7 and severely hindering firefighting. Eventually, fireboats were used to pump what water they could from the Hudson River. is from our vantage point, uh, but you can definitely see the smoke is starting to darken again. It means more things are catching on fire. For a while we saw a lot of white steam. Now the smoke again is starting to get to be very dark. Now if you can imagine, these firefighters have been on the scene for more than six hours at this point. They're not only having to battle a blaze, they're having to battle the smoke and all the debris in the ground. So it's a very physical fight as well as a very emotional fight for these firefighters as well as the EMTs and other rescue workers on the scene. Because the smoke is so incredibly noxious and so high and, and going so far, it's a good idea if you're in this general area at all to please stay inside, keep your windows closed, do not use your water. They need all the water pressure they can get at this point. They do have some unusual firefighting equipment on the ground today. Uh, the firefighter, which is a water boat, uh, it is a firefighting boat, and basically it sucks water out of the Hudson River and takes it directly to a, a pumper, which relays it to another pumper, and it's called a relay pump. 11,000 gallons of water per minute. It's an amazing piece of equipment. Also on hand are volunteer tugboats piloted by volunteers who have again brought their tugboats down, which can also suck water out of the river and then have connected to different uh, hoses in the general area and are able to then put water onto this fire without having to go into the water main. It's hard to say, perhaps some of the water mains may have even been damaged by this actual explosion and collapse of these buildings. Uh, but again, we have some unusual firefighting equipment in this area, which definitely uh, the smoke is getting much, much thicker now. As we're looking at our window, we are hovering at about 1,600 feet, 1,500 feet. And I'm telling you, this smoke is probably 5,000 feet into the air. I've never seen anything like this in my life. And again, the smoke is up. Uh, air traffic control has asked us to land. We have been the only aircraft allowed for several hours, for a couple hours at this point, and they have now asked us to land. So we're going to do that, and we're going to send it back to you. Uh, back to you. The firefighter is the queen of the fleet. It's the, uh, the biggest fireboat we have in New York City Harbor. It's one hell of a boat. It's capable of pumping 20,000 gallons a minute at 150 PSI. Turns, one crew would, would watch the boat, another crew would be in searching. When that crew came out, they would relieve the boat crew, the boat crew would go in and search. Yeah, they did a lot. These guys, uh, they also went and commandeered our pumpers to put in because basically with a fire boat, you can't just pump water right to the nozzle that the fireman's holding. You have to have 
a piece of equipment in between, a pumper to boost up the pressure. So these guys basically had to go crawling through the rubble to find rigs that were still working and drive them in between all with the other hoses in the rubble to get them, you know, into the right position to get the, enough pressure up to where the operation was. In Panama City, Florida, Friday, they launched New York City's newest fireboat, christened 343, to honor the 343 firefighters who perished in the attack on the World Trade Center. But the story our Rita Braver has to tell you this morning is about a very old New York fireboat, how it found its way into the history books. This gasoline-powered vessel was named for a fireboat captain who died on the job. This boat was built in what year? 1931. She's the first large, modern fireboat built in America in that everything before her was steam. I mean, that's the era. It's really quite incredible. But incredible or not, in 1994, New York City decided that the Harvey was over the hill and took her out of service. Six years later, she was to be auctioned off for scrap. That's when Gill, a preservation architect, and a group of about 20 friends heard about it. It was a bunch of us who reached into our own pockets and said, this is just too interesting not to do. But then, of course, you know, it's like a love affair. It, once you're in it, there's nothing you can do. And so the Harvey, now operated as a nonprofit, was on the water again. Then, September 11, 2001. Gil heard from another co-owner. We called the fire department and said, you guys need help. And they said, God knows we need all the help we can get. Just go down there and see if you can be of any use. Their first assignment was to help evacuate Lower Manhattan. Uh, people poured onto the boat, and we started heading north. As we're going north, this guy in the fire department sees this fire boat going by and says, we need them. With hydrants blocked on land, Hoses had already been strung from the city's two other fireboats, the river providing an unlimited water supply. Of course, the Harvey hadn't fought fires in years, and the crew member assigned to check out the 20 hose valves found a problem. He got all the way around on this thing, and there was just two that worked. Gosh. But Tim Ivory, himself a former firefighter, was able to jury rig a solution. It was just, let's try this, and for all I know, it could have failed miserably. Maybe it was divine intervention. I don't know. <laughs> and actually, the trees that are there, we were tied up to the trees. The Harvey kept at it for three days, pumping some 38 million gallons. My understanding is in, in the case of Building 7, there was no water pressure because of the breaking of water mains and so on with the collapse of the towers. Is that correct? Uh, that's what we determined, that uh, it, Building 7 collapsed prior to the time they were able to get the water pressure back up uh, uh, to higher levels. They, they didn't really get it up to normal levels, but at least get... And some the water, water we were taking out of the Hudson River, we were trying to put into the... Um, into uh, the debris on the, t on the towers to try to get out people, get them out alive. Yes. So what we have, though, is this incredible case study. When do you, are you able to determine if, the, if you did have proper water pressure and so on, whether the, you could have prevented the fire from consuming the building? Uh, we looked into that, discussed it uh, quite uh, a lot, and uh, uh, while we did not make a strong statement in the report, it was really beyond the scope of what we were doing. Uh, we do believe if it had been fought, they could have put it, uh, and if they could have put it out, that uh, there would not have been uh, the risk of collapse to that building.